Hello again, Boy here. In the previous video, I recommended some folk magic books for beginners, and I also mentioned that I'd like to do some videos on recommended books of folklore uh, and folk magic tool books in the future. I will definitely be getting back to that soon, but it occurred to me there might be people who don't really know what I mean when I say folk magic, especially as a professional folklorist and as a practitioner as well. So that's this video. Uh, I thought a crash course in folklore studies might be useful to those who are interested in learning about folk magic so that you can avoid some of the pitfalls of the path while also being on the same page, same page uh, as others who are studying and practicing it. This is kind of a super fast orientation to folklore uh, from a folklore professor, um, but you don't have to pay tuition, so that works out great. Uh, let's start with definitions. Uh, what is folklore? Well, simply put, it's the lore of the folk, but that means we need to kind of break that down into folk and lore. So who are the folk? Well, there's a lot of definitions even among folklorists. For example, going really broad, folklorist Alan Dundas defines folklore in eight words. He says, who are the folk? Among others, we are. Um, I feel like I prefer a definition more like the one from Utah State University folklore professor Lynn McNeil, who says, uh, people who share an unofficial culture together. So what is an unofficial culture? Well, that's the things that you learn and do and know from being a part of a group. Think about, for example, when you start a new job. Uh, you get the orientation video, the handbook, the managers tell you all the company policies. That's all official culture. But then you start working and you learn which managers will let you clock in a little bit late, uh, where to hide a water bottle and sneak a quick drink on the job. Or maybe you hear stories about one notoriously bad employee who never seems to get fired. That's all the unofficial culture. It's learned by being in the folk group and of the folk group. And knowing it's kind of a secret handshake for being part of the folk yourself, right? Uh, secret handshakes uh, can also be folklore, by the way. Uh, in addition to talking about unofficial culture, McNeil also emphasizes that we all belong to many folk groups. So say, for example, uh, you may be Italian-American. Uh, you may also be LGBTQ+. You may be a school student and a baker. Um, each of those can be a folk group, and each is going to have folklore. So then what do we mean by lore? Well, going back to Alan Dundas, uh, in a longer definition, he talks about folklore being informal traditions between any group of people who share at least one common factor. So if you share a common bond with another person over, say, ethnicity, work skills, or even geography, you may be in the folk group and there will be folklore associated with it. It's important to note that the word tradition is in there too. That comes from a root word associated with both trade and trader. Uh, and it means handing over, handing along, or handing down. Uh, the passage of cultural information, those informal traditions or lore, has to be done by members of the folk group. But crucially, folklore has no official authorship. Folklorist Barry Tolkien described this as a dynamic process of variation within tradition. That may sound really heady, but it basically means folklore is alive, changing all the time, while still holding on to a few core elements that are important to the folk. So let me give you an example. You've probably heard the story of Little Red Riding Hood, right? In the version that you know, does Red live or die at the end of the story? In some tellings, like the one recorded by Charles Perrault in the late 1700s, Red and Granny are eaten by the wolf, and that's that. But another version is found only a few decades later in Germany by the Grimms, and are rescued by a passing woodsman. In that same collection, even the Grimms have another version, where Red and Granny trick the wolf and cook him in a pot when he falls down the chimney. None of these versions are wrong or inaccurate but they represent changes that happen as the story moves around in time and space. Importantly, some things stay mostly the same. A young girl uh, visiting a sick grandmother or a relative tricked by a wolf or a similar predator. She often has distinctive clothing like her red cap or a cloak. And we frequently have portions of the story with the what big body parts you have in most versions. But the details change, and not just from France to Germany. In fact, folklorist Richard Bauman notes that tales change not from place to place or teller to teller even, but from telling to telling. The folklore changes because something wasn't working or something else worked better, or just because the person sharing the folklore, which we call tradition bearer in our fanciest pants folklorist jargon, uh, decided to make a creative redirect. It doesn't invalidate the folklore or the folk group, so long as some of those core pieces stay the same. So that's folklore and uh, folk, but what about magic? Uh, I won't go into a very long history of the term here, but it's suffice to say it loosely comes from Greek words used to describe the spiritual practices of foreign priests. So basically it was those weirdos and their superstitions. 
the Greeks distinguished the magi or magi from magia or mago and other types of spiritual supernatural works such as goetia, which would be more spirit summoning necromantic type stuff, and pharmakos, which would be poisons and potions, things like that. Uh, by the Middle Ages, there were also distinctions about the specific uses of these practices with things like necromancy specifically, sortilege and sortilegerie, uh, which forgive my French there, basically means sorcery, uh, and maleficum, uh, which is evil witchcraft or magic. By and large, magic meant the use of unseen forces to change things for better or worse, although by the time of the Enlightenment, it was essentially relegated to superstition. But that's an important word to look at, too. The roots of superstition are super, over, and stitio, standing. So, overstanding versus understanding. Rather than knowing how something works from the inside out or the bottom up the way you would by understanding it, you see the connections between a seemingly unrelated uh, group of things, a web of connection. It's based on observation, uh, though not empirical science type of observation. So someone seeing a black cat crossing their path might have learned through personal experience or wisdom shared by others that they need to turn back and start their journey another day because something bad is waiting for them out there. Or conversely, it might be a sign of good luck and promise a great day ahead. It just depends on what your folk group's traditions and observations say. We often see superstition treated as something to mock, but like many aspects of culture, when something is other or not familiar to us, we tend to label it as superstition or magic. In the tongue-in-cheek words of folklorist Eric Eliasson, what you do is superstition and magic, what I do is religion. So if superstition sees connections between the black cat crossing your path and the outcome of your journey, for better or worse, magic is the way we change or affect those outcomes through our own actions. The web of connection is like music or language, weaving between very different things. In fact, language is a good analogy here. One of the ways I personally envision magic is as a sort of grammar of the world. The verbs of your ritual actions in making a little bundle of cloth and herbs combine with the nouns of the outcome you hope to have, and your spoken spell describes how you expect that to happen, the adjectives and the adverbs. Now, before you go thinking that this is just because I'm a writer and I'm going too deep in the grammar thing, it is worth remembering that the word grammar is related to the word grimoire, which is the collection of magical works and texts. So I'm not just making up this analogy out of nothing. Okay, it's mostly my own analogy, but it does have some good linguistic roots. Um, if magic, then, is a language, we should also know that there are multiple ways to phrase things and that those make up the types of magic. Think about it this way. How many different words can you think of for soft drink? You might think soda, pop, cola, or you might be from the South and just say a Coke. You might also think of a specific brand like Coca-Cola or in parts of the South, Coca-Cola. Uh, Pepsi, Dr. Pepper, those sorts of things. Generally, if you ask for these things, you'll get something like what you're asking for. But if you ask for a soft drink and someone gives you lemonade, you might have a puzzled look on your face. Technically, lemonade is a soft drink, but it isn't usually what we mean. And we know to ask for it more specifically by name. Similarly, the results you want from a magical working depend on the type of magic you're doing. Some of the main ones are sympathetic magic, in which like affects like and like indicates like something we see especially in something called the Doctrine of Signatures, which claims that things like plants have specific designs or signatures that tell us what they're useful for. A hairy-stemmed plant that had a thick mucousy sap would be used as a cough medicine, for example, because the little hairy prickles resemble the bronchial tube or the blood vessels in the lungs. Then we have contagious magic, uh, which contact spreads effects. This can be slipping something into a potion, uh, or it can be just leaving something on the ground for someone to step on, like we see in some African-American folk magic. There's also divination, systems of knowing or gathering information through irregular means, like omens or the tarot. And there's evocation, uh, which is the summoning of spirits that may or may not always be part of the sympathetic branch. Um, these spirits might be summoned to do the summoner's bidding or to answer questions for them, which might make them a little bit more on the uh, divination side. So then what makes magic folk magic? Well, like all culture, magic can be official, such as the official priestly divination done by a religious authority in Ifa, or the use of sanctioned prophets, or it can be unofficial, and that's folk magic. Folk magic is the magic that derives from traditional practices of a folk community, learning the way things work from folk group members. It's a local dialect of magic that changes from place to place, but each version of that folk magic will hold on to a few core ingredients that are essential to the folk group. It's informal, traditional magic. It gets passed on from person to person, has no authorship, and is connected to the cultural group. 
It changes over time while holding onto core elements. There's no official sanction or oversight, no priesthood, no inviolable forms, and usually it's not very ceremonial or prescriptive. And importantly, it doesn't have to be religious in nature, but it often does connect with the spiritual worldview. Although in the 20th century on, the inner world of the human, psyche or psychology, represents a sort of spiritual worldview, so inner magic is absolutely valid. In short, folk magic equals magic derived from the folk, as we've described above. So how do you start studying folk magic? Well, getting into folk magic essentially requires three key prongs. You need to look at what has existed, what still exists, and what you're going to bring to the table. In terms of what has existed, that's the folklore of the past, stories, practices, written records, and so forth. There's a lot to work with, but remember, it loses variation once it's locked down on the page like that. So the folk magic you find written in a collection from the 1930s might have been representative of that place and time, but it might have changed drastically by the day. There was heavy emphasis on this sort of past mining in the early days of folklore studies, and a lot of folk magical practitioners still make this the biggest part of learning folk magic. This work is still valuable, but it needs context. That's what brings us to what exists now, the living traditions. This is working with tradition bearers or informants to learn traditions now. An example might be learning to knit from your grandmother or grandfather, or learning to knit by picking it up from YouTube. It's important to note, new folklore does exist and gets created all the time. So for example, there's photocopy cartoons that appeared when Xerox machines were invented, and that later became things like memes and creepypastas. There are also changes in folk magic. Uh, take the use of freezer spells, which would have been very different in the era before refrigeration, right? Uh, similarly, we don't use liquid mercury and gambling charms much anymore because it's the safety risk it poses, right? So finally, we get to the third part of studying folk magic. What do you bring to the table? Your variation on a tradition may be perfectly useful and valid, so long as it doesn't completely negate or violate the community collective's vision of that use of tradition. An example I like to point to is somebody uh, like artist Rachel Yoder. Uh, she's a contemporary folk artist making art in the Pennsylvania German style, but she incorporates other themes on occasion, drawing inspiration, for example, from the Mexican-American Dia de Muertos designs. Uh, some of her work is still uh, identifiably Pennsylvania German, and she is a Pennsylvania German living within that community. Uh, but she's included some elements uh, such as skulls, which represent that Mexican-American identity. An inverse of this, that's from very culturally appropriative, is the ubiquitous dream catcher we see hanging from so many rearview mirrors. Many times these are not made by Ojibwe artists and are only loosely based on the designs with no real purpose behind, uh, behind them or no sense of the real meaning uh, to the original communities that made them. They're sold by businesses where they never get the money back to the Ojibwe community or the similar communities that use those designs. So the folk side of it has been stripped almost completely away to make it mass cultural. And that does real damage to the folk community. Um, and that can, that continually uh, impacts the use of the Dreamcatcher, right? Uh, but if you learned about making a uh, Dreamcatcher from an Ojibwe person for your own use, that might still be from that realm of tradition, depending on a few other factors, right? So if you're looking to study folk magic, the things you wanna do are one, look at folklore records, books, recordings, and so forth, while remembering they're just a specific snapshot of folk magic for one person at one time in one place. So then you wanna to talk to and learn from living tradition bearers. That can be tricky, but in the age of the internet, you have more opportunities than ever to do that. And three, practice and add your own variations without exerting any authority or ownership over the practice. Make sure you know whether or not you are part of the folk of that practice or not as well. And if you're interested in kind of expanding this a little bit uh, and learning a little bit more uh, kind of on the academic side, uh, I do have a couple of book recommendations, of course, why not? Uh, so one thing I definitely recommend if you're interested in getting kind of a good grounding on folklore and folklore studies, um, I recommend Lynn McNeil's Folklore Rules. Um, it's a very slim, very uh, easy to read volume. You can probably clear it in the afternoon, but it gives you a very good grounding in the basics of folklore studies. Uh, it covers everything from uh, what has folklore studies looked like in the past to these definitions of folk and folklore. It uh, talks a little bit uh, about things like the different types of folklore that you can collect, uh, everything ranging from um, uh, community-based and ethnic folklore uh, to things like occupational folklore, folklore being uh, a school student, everything like that, uh, as well as getting into internet folklore as well. So uh, it's very, very uh, good for an introduction, particularly for, for people who maybe um, aren't, uh, aren't looking to make this kind of a professional thing, but I do have an, uh, an interest beyond kind of the casual uh, in folklore. The other side of this is that I was looking for things to maybe recommend uh, about the history of folk magic. And that's a little trickier um, because there's a lot of specific histories and specific information on particular branches of folk magic. But there's not a ton that really gets into the history of folk magic more generally. 
Um, some people might uh, might recommend something like James Frazier's Golden Bough. Um, I do actually I have that on my bookshelf here, um, but I don't necessarily recommend that as something that you should go to and read right away. Uh, one, it's a little denser, I think, than kind of the general access texts um, that I would recommend. And two, uh, it's also uh, got a lot of problems too. So I don't I don't really jump into that one uh, as, as something that you should learn first. Um, so instead, what I kind of am going to recommend um, is this book, um, which is the Oxford Illustrated History of Witchcraft and Magic. Um, it's it, it's a little more Euro uh, centric, Euro focused um, than than I would like, um, but it does give you some good backgrounds in the ideas of what is magic, where does the term magic come from, um, what did magic look like as it sort of evolved out of uh, ancient practices moving into uh, the Middle Ages and then even into the modern day. Um, so you really do get a sense of um, what folk magic looked like, like in each of those kind of iterations. Uh, as well as kind of looking at the sort of more official or ceremonial types of magic too. So those are my recommendations if you're interested uh, in just kind of getting a good theoretical basis uh, for diving into the study of folklore and folk magic more generally. All right, that's going to do it for me for this time. Uh, next time I will be back uh, hopefully talking about uh, folklore books specifically on folk uh, magic, folk magical traditions from particular places um, that are really, really good uh, for reading and learning about the particular practices of those areas um, uh, and folklore texts that I personally recommend, uh, uh, either as a kind of 201 how-to folk magic or just to, uh, to start sort of uh, doing your own research in folklore as well. So I hope you'll come back for that. Uh, until next time, thank you so much for watching and be well. <laughs>